Welcome back for another video. Before we begin this video though, I just want to let y'all know Barrio Tales hoodies are now available. Red, black, purple, orange, and blue. Cash App and PayPal are how you can reach me. They're only $25 with free shipping. Don't just look at it, wear it. T-shirts are also available still. All you gotta do is hit that Cash App and PayPal that you see right there. Thank you. Welcome back for another video on the best YouTube channel ever. Today's video will be about the Eastside Clover Gang. The Eastside Clover Gang is located in the Lincoln Heights community of LA County. Eastside Clover sports the color green. Rivals of Eastside Clover include East Lake, Vario Lincoln Heights, and Dogtown. In 2008, there was internal conflict within the Clover Gang that turned into something very common in the gang world. On March 31st, 2008, Eastside Clover gang member Daniel Danny Boy Gonzalez shot and killed fellow Eastside Clover member Jose Garcia. Gonzalez was released just weeks ago from state prison where he served time for carjacking and attempted murder stemming from a 1997 case. But that's not all. This time around, he left his friend dead, police ducking for cover, and neighbors and nearby merchants scrambling in fear. After the Highland Park shooting, somebody dropped Gonzalez off in Glendale, where unbeknown to police, he was armed with a handgun and extra ammunition. The gun battle took place after an officer, suspicious that Gonzalez might be casing closed commercial businesses for burglary, got out of his patrol car about 9.30 p.m. and approached him on Adams Street near Colorado Street. They made eye contact. Gonzalez began to take a few steps and take a shot at the officer. The bullet goes right over his head as the officer took cover and radioed for backup. He watched Gonzalez run south on Adams before heading east on Elk Avenue. Once Gonzalez got to Elk and Chevy Chase Drive, he hid in some bushes in front of a two-story home on the northwest corner. Two officers who drove up in their patrol cars got out and were ambushed. He starts shooting at the officers from the bushes. They see muzzle flashes. As the officer shot back, one of them was hit in the chest, but was wearing a bulletproof vest, saving their life. Gonzalez then ran north on Chevy Chase toward Colorado. Another officer in a patrol car cut him off in the driveway of a small house. In the 300 block of Chevy Chase, about 100 yards short of the busy intersection, Gonzalez shot at the officer blasting two bullet holes through the front windshield of a squad car and shattering their rear window. The officer, a sergeant with more than 15 years on the job, fired back, killing Gonzalez. In an surreal end to the night, Gonzalez died in a driveway just feet from a nearby business, Advent Tombstones Monuments. On the afternoon of August 3rd, 2001, Frank Hernandez, a member of the East Lake Gang, was at home with his mother, Carmen Zapata, who was deaf, and his girlfriend, Shirley Sanchez. Hernandez and his mother were in the living room of their apartment, and Sanchez was in a bedroom. Zapata felt a boom from a gunshot, then saw Hernandez fall to the floor. Looking up, she saw a young man standing in the doorway, holding a gun. The man fired a second shot at Hernandez. Zapata grabbed the shooter's hand and tried to close the door, but the shooter put his foot in the doorway to prevent her from doing so. Zapata was face to face with the shooter during the struggle. After Sanchez heard the first shot, she entered the living room where she saw some guy shooting while Zapata tried to protect her son. Sanchez helped Zapata force the door close, shutting the shooter out of the apartment. Zapata waited a few minutes and then went to a neighbor for help calling the police. The police received the 911 call at 1.25 p.m. When they arrived, they found Hernandez dead of gunshot wounds to the chest and abdomen. At the police station, Zapata was interviewed by detectives. Detectives were assisted by a records clerk who had learned American Sign Language from her stepmother and by taking classes. Detectives showed Zapata a gang book which was a book of 160 pictures of people whom the police believed belonged to the Clover Gang. Zapata right away identified a photograph of Daniel Vasquez. 
detectives testified that Zapata became like excited and scared and pointing, making noises with their mouth and gesturing that he was the shooter. After selecting the photograph of Vasquez, Zapata wrote out the following statement. The person in photo number five is the person that shot my son today. The police separately interviewed Shirley Sanchez when she reviewed the gang book. Sanchez selected photographs of two men, one of whom was Daniel Vasquez. She described the shooter as a light-skinned Hispanic male, 20 to 22 years old, 5 feet 9 to 5 feet 10, tall with a shaved head. Sanchez told the police that she had seen the shooter about five times before the shooting and identified him as a member of the Clover Gang, a rival to the East Lake Gang to which Hernandez belonged. She said that the shooter had driven by the apartment holding a gun about three weeks earlier. She said that she heard the man tell Hernandez, You can't be living here. Your homeboys killed mine not long ago, so you had better move out. I am not playing no games. Shortly thereafter, Daniel Vasquez was arrested and charged with Hernandez's murder. The prosecution also introduced evidence of bad blood between Vasquez's Clover Gang and Hernandez's East Lake Gang. In the end, Daniel Vasquez from Clover was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to 60 years in prison. Another East Side Clover gang member named Roberto Preciado shot two people in two separate incidents, killing a 17-year-old young man and seriously injuring an 84-year-old woman. When Roberto was arrested a week after the second incident, he had on him the gun used in both shootings and four bags of meth. Here's how both killings took place. Jesus Lopez, a 17-year-old young man, was riding his bike near where Roberto and his fellow gang members had been tagging that evening. Lopez lived in the neighborhood. Though a member of a tagging crew, he was not a gang member. After the Clover gang members finished tagging, they headed back to the party. As Lopez was walking back, he heard three gunshots after hearing Roberto say, Where are you from? Lopez turned around and saw two other Clover gang members on the sidewalk. He did not see Roberto or anyone with a gun. A surveillance video partially depicted the incident. The video showed two people walking while another person was riding a bicycle. When one of the pedestrians stepped off the sidewalk, the bicyclist changed course to avoid the pedestrian. The pedestrian walked toward the bicyclist who rode out of the camera's view. The pedestrian raised his hand and appeared to be holding a gun at 8.27 p.m. According to the timestamp on the video, because of the video's poor quality, the persons appearing in it could not be identified. At about 8.35 p.m., a police officer responded to the scene. He saw a bicycle and a trail of blood leading away from it. He followed the trail and found Lopez hunched over a staircase. Lopez was bleeding heavily and having difficulty breathing. Lopez saw that he had been shot and that three people were involved. An ambulance arrived minutes later, and Lopez was taken to the hospital. Lopez died from two gunshot wounds to his back. One bullet pierced his lung and perforated his internal jugular vein. The second bullet perforated his intestine. Upon investigating the murder, the police spoke with Victoria Castro in a recorded interview played to the jury. Castro, a member of a Clover gang clique, said that she attended the party on the night of the murder. While there, a group of men left to go tagging, including Roberto, who she believed had a gun. Castro remained at the party and later heard gunshots. After the gunshots, the group of taggers ran back to the house. Castro then saw Roberto and a gang member nicknamed Risky leave in a truck. After the shooting, Roberto told Castro that he was at a motel in Highland Park with Risky and bragged that he dropped an enemy. At the time, Castro did not know that Lopez, one of her friends, was the murder victim. When she later learned that Lopez was the victim, she confronted Roberto, who apologized. Roberto told her that he had banged on Lopez or asked Lopez where he was from, but Lopez did not respond. Castro later testified at the preliminary hearing in the case and repeated her recorded statement to the police, including that Roberto had told her that he had killed an enemy and that he had messed up. At trial, however, Castro recanted her prior statements. She testified that Roberto never told her that he had killed someone and that the only truthful part of her prior statements 
was that she attended the party on the day of the murder and explaining her prior inconsistent statements. Castro claimed that the police fed her the information about Roberto and threatened to take her child away and charge her with murder if she did not cooperate. In response to Castro's trial testimony, the prosecution introduced evidence corroborating her prior statements, including cell phone records for Castro's phone and for a phone that undisputedly belonged to Roberto. The content of the text messages between these phones was consistent with Castro's pre-trial statements. Castro previously stated that Roberto had told her that he went to a Highland Park motel with Risky after the shooting. A text message sent from Roberto's to Castro's phone after the murder stated, Just here with Risky at another motel. The HLP, another text message sent from Roberto's phone several hours later stated it was a tagger. The records also confirm that Roberto and Castro had spoken by phone after the murder just as Castro had told the police. In addition, Roberto's phone was within a mile and a half radius of the location of the murder when Lopez was shot and was later used to download a news article about Lopez's murder. The police also obtained registration records from the Highland Park Deluxe Inn. A registration card from that motel showed that Roberto checked in for an overnight stay on July 16, 2011, the day of the murder, as Castro had stated. Now, the second murder committed by Roberto Preciado on July 23, 2011, Victor Soto Contreras witnessed an altercation between two men outside a store in Lincoln Heights. One man wore a black shirt and the other wore a white shirt. The man in white swung at the man in black. At that point, according to Contreras, the man in black pulled out a handgun and fired at the man in white who ran away. The man in black ran to a nearby street and entered into an apartment building. Contreras called the police and reported what had occurred. He later identified Roberto as the shooter, stating that he was 80% certain. Vanessa Flores also was in the area of the shooting that morning. While she was in her car with her baby at a red light, she saw Roberto across the street in front of her with a gun wrapped in a white t-shirt. He stretched out his hand as he approached a parked car and pointed the gun at the driver's side of the car. Flores turned her attention to her crying baby when she heard three or four popping sounds. When she looked up, she saw Roberto run away and enter the driveway of an apartment building. She drove away and called the police. The police arrived at the scene soon after the shooting. She was bleeding profusely from gunshot wounds to her feet caused by the shooting. The officers also discovered four 9mm shell casings in the area. The police did not find the man in white. However, the police did locate Roberto in the apartment building that he was seen entering and took him into custody. Roberto did not have a gun in his possession. At the police station, Contreras and Flores identified Roberto as the gunman. The police also did a gun residue test of Roberto's hands and clothing to see if he recently had fired a gun. The test results were inconclusive and the police released Roberto. But on July 30, 2011, police officers responded to a report that two men were drinking and smoking narcotics in Lincoln Heights Park. As the officers approached the park, Roberto took off running but stopped when ordered to do so. Roberto told the officers that he was carrying a gun. One of the officers removed a loaded 9mm handgun from a holster inside Roberto's waistband and four 9mm bullets from one of Roberto's pockets, including meth. The gun found on Roberto when he was arrested was used to murder Lopez and to shoot and hit Rosas. According to subsequent ballistic testing, the shell casings found at the scene of both shootings were discharged from that handgun. Following a jury trial, Roberto Perciado was convicted of both murders along with multiple crimes associated with murder. Roberto Perciado from Eastside Clover was sentenced to 75 years to life in prison.